Hey, thanks for tuning in with us today and hope you are doing well. Today, we're going to dive into our fourth session of our Wanted Workshop series together. And what that means is, is we just open our Bibles and we get a pen and a highlighter ready. And we go through and we make a chain Bible study, helping us to walk through different topics to study. And so today, the topic we're actually studying together is a chain study on the Trinity. So hopefully you have your Bibles with you. Uh, and I'm excited as we walk through this study together. So as we start our chain Bible study on the Trinity, I want to keep a couple things in mind. Uh, one, I did not plan during this study to actually talk about the roles or functions of each person in the Trinity. Uh, my goal in this study was to introduce more of the characters that make up the Trinity. So in case you come across those who maybe don't, aren't even familiar at all with the Trinity, uh, since that word itself is not actually found in Scripture. So this study is going to completely concentrate on each person of the Trinity. So maybe in the future you might want to go make separate Bible studies, um, separate chain studies on who God is, uh, who Jesus is, and who the Holy Spirit is. But for today, like we just said, uh, staying with the characters of the Trinity. So the first verse I decided to come to here, as you can see highlighted in the front page of my Bible, is Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. Uh, I've chose Matthew 28 and verse 19 for a specific reason. Uh, this is a really good verse that we're going to see uh, that we come across multiple times in our study. But for this one, you'll notice as I've circled, uh, all three of our persons in the Trinity are mentioned in this one verse. And so uh, that's why I've highlighted this one first, because in Matthew 28, 19, it says, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Um, and you'll mention here, uh, I'd like to mention here, that each of these are distinct persons. And so it's not just grouped together. Um, it's the Trinity here. And the tri equals three. And the unity we mean is one. Um, the good question to ask here at the beginning of the study is, how can God be both one and three? Well, we might not be able to answer it in this passage, but we're going to continue looking throughout the study to be able to answer questions like that. Uh, so the next one we come to is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 through 6. And again, the reason I gave this one is because it explains that God is three in one. Uh, we see the word spirit, we see the word Lord, and we see the word God, all with same uh, characterizing them. And so again, the first two verses we come to in this study are both going to introduce all three of those persons to us. Like mentioned earlier, the word Trinity itself is never actually used in the Bible. That's a word that's been uh, given um, for uh, these three persons. Uh, so where do we start uh, is the question we come to now. Uh, the reason I picked these two passages first, like I just mentioned, I think they encompass really well um, what the Trinity is because they mention all three persons. But where do we go now from here? Well, I suggest we turn to the beginning in Genesis 1 in verse 1, I think it's a great place to start because that is in the beginning. And we know that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See, God the Father, his role is to generate things. Uh, that's what he does. He starts things. Um, what things did God create? Well, if you want to look through here and do some context study, you'll see the things God created all throughout. This is a good place to camp for a while and talk about uh, God as being a creator and being a generator. Um, but as we move over to James now, back into our New Testament, we see here in verse 17 uh, that every good gift uh, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. So again, all things originate with him, meaning God, and they flow from him. Well, good question here is, well, why did God create all of this? Or what was his purpose in doing so? Well, we turn over to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7 through 16. The reason I give is because God created us because he loves us. Um, we see here, in verse 7 through 16, that love is from God, and whoever has been born of God knows God. Uh, and it continues to say that God is love. And all throughout here, I don't give you much here in this PDF because I didn't want you to rely too heavily upon that. I'd rather you focus in on what the text says and find out for yourself the important things you want to underline and circle. But um, am I in love with God? That's what this passage is really asking. I need to ask myself. But we come next to that ever so popular verse, in John 3, uh, verse 16, but also a little bit after that, uh, for God so loved the world. Now, as you can tell, this next little phrase, that he gave his only son, this is where I'm going to start our transition. Um, I talked about God first in these first three verses, 
because that's where it all starts um, because we are loved by God and we're wanted by God. But this is going to be where we transition into the next person of the Trinity, which is Jesus. Um, the good question to ask here is, do you believe in the Son of God? Do you actually believe that he came to the earth and did what he did? And so that's where the transition begins in John, looking at John chapter 1. Now, this is a pretty lengthy passage. Um, so again, somewhat like our last video, I just highlighted the parts that if I was needing to pick just essential areas and just had enough time to talk about certain things, that's what I highlighted. Um, you may find different things to highlight. Um, you may want to highlight the whole thing or only the first verse. Um, but I found this to be important because Jesus was with God in the beginning. Uh, it says here, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, that's referring to Jesus Christ. He was with Jesus. Uh, Jesus was with God in the beginning. Now, how could Jesus, God's Son, have been with him in the beginning? You know, uh, I wasn't with my father in the beginning. Um, my father came first, and many, many years later I came. So I wasn't with my father in the beginning. So how can we say that Jesus, being God's Son, was with him in the beginning? Well, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 11, uh, it looks like a little bit of poor quality here in the picture. But have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This gives us our answer. I love it a lot of times when we ask the questions, but then we go to Scripture for the answers. And that's why this is a chain Bible study, because they're building off each other. God, the Son's role is to pay for our sins with his blood. So we have God the Father, and we have God the Son. And here's the two parts to this trinity so far. Um, the question here is, and we can get real practical with this, is how did Jesus pay for our sins? Well, Isaiah 53, uh, verse 3 through 5, it tells us. It goes through that scene of, of prophecy of where Jesus is going to be uh, afflicted and persecuted uh, and crushed for our iniquities. Jesus paid for our sins by dying on the cross. Why did he have to die? Uh, why couldn't Jesus have uh, done something else in order to uh, suffice that payment for sin? Why couldn't Jesus have just snapped his fingers and made it all go away? Why was it that he had to die for? Well, uh, a lot of questions and a lot of answers can be given here. And so I encourage you, take some time, uh, fill in some blanks. But when we move to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse uh, 5 through 6, again, this is one of those answers to that question. There's one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. The Son acts as that lawyer figure for us before God. So in that courtroom scene with God being the judge, you know, the judge is impartial here. He's letting you plead your case. Well, usually in the court of law, most people don't plead their own case. They hire someone uh, to do that for them, and that's the lawyer. Well, Jesus acts as that lawyer. He does the speaking for us. That's why he died for our sins, so he would have that ability to do so. Um, but some may ask, well, why do I need a mediator? Um, first off, I circled the word mediator so I can make sure I knew what that was. I also circled the word God. Um, but I should have circled you know, Christ Jesus, but it looks like I underlined it because we're still focusing on these two parts of the Trinity. Again, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on God in the first three, four verses because most people have a grasp for who or what God is. Um, Jesus, um, there's a lot more to it to try to separate these two. It's hard to say they're both one, but yet they are individual people. And so that's going to take a lot more uh, in-depth study that this certain chain is not doing. Uh, again, this one is just identifying our characters. But maybe we'll make another one in the future just talking about who Jesus is and who God is. Um, but when you think about this question of why do I need a mediator, we turn to John 14. Here in John 14, I have two images because my Bible has to turn the page. Um, and yours may not be that way. But the reason we need a mediator is because Jesus is the only way to God. Um, there's lots of religions out there and lots of different beliefs out there of different ways uh, to receive uh, Christ, to receive God, to, to have that inheritance. But we know from Scripture that Jesus said, I am the way. And then he said, the truth and the life. I really enjoy the ESV here because it doesn't take away that article V, it keeps it in there because it's signifying there's only one. It's individual. Um, and so we see here that no one comes to the Father except through him. The question I have here is, what is Jesus claiming? Um, the Pharisees uh, and the Jews got really upset here 
because he said that I am the only way, I'm the only truth. And he also said that if you have known me, you have known my Father, um, and that I and the Father are of one, um, as you, if you keep reading there. And so uh, some people got really upset. And so what exactly is Jesus trying to claim? Well, he makes it much more clear here in John 10, verse 30, when he says, just flat out, I and the Father are one. Uh, he's not just the Son of God, but God the Son. It's kind of a confusing statement. That's why I encourage you to make sure you understand this. But why did this make the Jews so mad? Uh, we just mentioned um, Jesus is just saying, hey, I and the Father are one. We're the same person. But they got real upset about this. Um, to prove this even further, uh, this is where our transition period happens uh, here in verse 2, back to Genesis again. We were just here earlier talking about God. The second part here is, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Uh, maybe you've never noticed that part of that verse before, or maybe you've read it a hundred times, and you're like, yeah, I knew that. Um, what that's saying here is the Holy Spirit of God. That's referring to God's Holy Spirit. Um, that's referring to the third person of the Trinity. Now, it's important to make notice that uh, the third does not mean the least important. That's just as far as roles go. And that's a whole other study. But the Spirit of God was also there. Um, the Holy Spirit is not just a force but a divine person who was present in the beginning. Um, can you see here, the question that you should ask, um, can you see here all three persons at work in the beginning? Uh, we saw John 1, 1, where it said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. We see Jesus here in the beginning, God. We see him, and then we see in verse 2, the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the water. So we can see all three of these at work as we continue. But here in John 14, we come across again, one of those times where uh, we have some verses touching, and so this sometimes could be a little bit of confusion. So I've gone on and highlighted to the right the different colors uh, indicating where they go. So what we're looking at here is verse 26, referring to the third person of the Trinity, but the helper, the Holy Spirit. So uh, it's referred to as the helper uh, often throughout the New Testament, and there's more verses than I've provided that talk about the helper. But just in case, the author here has went ahead and said that the helper, meaning the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring your remembrance all that I have said to you. He is our comforter and he helps us. So good question here is, well, why do we need a helper? You know, if Jesus came, if God created, why do we need anything else? Uh, what's the purpose in having this helper? Well, not just as an influence, but we need to understand he's the third person of the Trinity. I'm often guilty a lot of times of doing this. But I sometimes will refer to the Holy Spirit as it, like it works in this way. I, I might have already done that in this video. Um, but the Holy Spirit's not a glorified it. Uh, it's, a, it's referred to as a person, um, and it's to our advantage. But how is it to our advantage to have this Holy Spirit? Now, we're flying through this, moving awful quick. I encourage you again, if you need to, the PowerPoints are available for this, and uh, pause when you need to. But here in uh, Romans 8, verse 26, God, the Holy Spirit, he helps us pray. Uh, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. for We do not know what we need to pray uh, as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he searches the heart and knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Uh, this is a good time to reflect. Have you ever had times in your life where you knew you needed to pray or talk to God, but maybe you just couldn't find the words uh, to say, well, the Spirit's actively involved in helping us do that. Uh, here's a final greeting uh, for us um, where it says here in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Again, all three of these are mentioned. So I thought it'd be appropriate to end on a strong passage or verse rather, and it's actually a final greeting too, which is appropriate. That's in her, uh, using all three of these. When we are lost in our sin, God acts in every person of his being to save us. Uh, we see here the Father gave the Son. The Son gave himself, and the Holy Spirit brought us to Jesus. Those are great talking points uh, when you're studying with someone uh, or just needing a reminder for yourself. Um, knowing this, does this change your understanding? Uh, and what I mean by that is understanding the persons of the, whole, of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the Son, the Father, um, although we don't necessarily have their roles down, which we might never be able to understand the Holy Spirit because of its divine nature, we're not supposed to, but does getting a grasp for each one change your understanding uh, and make a difference when you're reading through Scripture? Uh, hopefully, 
uh, this study on the Trinity has helped you. And if nothing else, uh, it's just giving you another uh, Bible study at your fingertips to be familiar with. But next week, uh, we're going to get a little heavier, and we're going to do a chain study on salvation. Uh, and what we mean by that is what it takes. In Acts chapter 2, uh, they asked Peter in verse 38, what must we do to receive eternal life? Well, we're going to answer that question uh, with the Bible, uh, not with our own opinions. So uh, I encourage you to join back with us again next week as we continue our Wanted Workshop series.